All right. Uh, yeah. So thanks everyone who's joined us so far tonight. Uh, I'm Emily. I'm the acting executive director here at the BC Humanist Association. And I'm just going to say a brief introduction before I turn things over to Paige. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that I live and work on the ancestral and unceded territories of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wissanic peoples, uh, whose historic relationships with the land continue to this day. And while I'm grateful for the opportunity to be, to be on this shared territory, I was not invited to do so. Um, and like I said just a couple moments ago, uh, for anyone who missed it, I've muted everyone in the audience tonight uh, to prevent any inadvertent interruptions during Paige's presentation, but there will be a QA and a at the end uh, where you have the opportunity to ask her some questions. So uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to add them into the chat um, and those will be top of the queue for when we get to the Q&A. We're recording this talk tonight, by the way, um, and it will be released later on our podcast and YouTube channel if you uh, want to share it or if you know anyone who wanted to attend but couldn't make it. Um, so tonight's talk is Trinity Western University and the Court of Public Opinion, a closer look at the role of religion in society. Um, if you wanna to come to our next event, it is a presentation with our research team on our report that is launching on Monday about uh, tax exemptions and churches. So that should be very exciting. Um, I promise it is more exciting than taxes. Uh, and um, yeah, so I'm just gonna turn things over to Paige now. Hello, thank you for that, Emily. Uh, so uh, I'm Paige, I am a doctoral student at the University of Victoria, doing my PhD in law and looking at the question of religious lawyering. Um, but I recently defended my master's and what I looked at was Trinity Western University and the evolution of their community covenant over time. And so, um, and so I, I can't even remember actually how we got in touch, Emily. I think I might have had something on my Twitter page and you found me. And so thank you so much for extending this invitation to me. And there's a few bodies that I would like to thank. I would like to thank the University of Victoria and particularly the Center for the Studies of Religion and Society for giving me a place to think about this and talk about this and delve into this. Uh, and then um, most importantly, I'd really like to thank uh, Trinity Western, the students, the faculty, the staff. Um, they were really, really welcoming of me as a, as not only a researcher, but as a lefty, openly gay feminist, uh, they were very enthusiastic about me and my research and very open to speaking about me. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just thankful to all of those bodies. So this is such a big, huge topic, and it was really hard for me to decide what to bring into today's uh, chat and what to sort of leave out. And I'm going to do a, a little bit of a, a recap uh, in terms of Trinity and why they were before the courts and why it's controversial. So for people who don't know a lot about this, I'm going to give you a very quick sort of recap. So I just want to start off with this question. So are Trinity Westerns or were Trinity Western universities actions against the law? And there's a reason why I put the law there in quotes, and I'll talk about that. And I really ask this here, and I want you to kind of think about this throughout, but I ask this here because this was the debate that I had with really so many people, uh, including other scholars, lawyers, law students, that what a lot of people said to me was, well, they're breaking the law. Uh, without, I think, any critical or critically reflective thought about what that meant or what they were saying. And most people that that I spoke to when they found out what, um, what I was doing as my research, they had assumptions about where my point of view um, landed. And I'm gonna come back to this question at the end and I'm gonna kind of open it up to, to the group. And so <laughs> a little bit about the, the big picture. So I would say that the community covenant, and I'll explain in a minute what that, what that is, it's not indicative of this insular group of evangelical Christians that refuse to acknowledge the existence of a secular world, 
you know, many of the students in the faculty that I spoke with, they're, they're swimming in the same waters as the rest of us, and many of them want to see inclusion for LGBTQ students. Um, Trinity Western, I would say, is like a school in, uh, it's like a school like many others in that their students really reflect a broad range of beliefs. So from the very conservative, um, conservative Christian, whatever that sort of means to you, to the very liberal kind of uh, social, social Bible um, Christian. Uh, what Christian, what, what TWD does offer its students is a place, is a Christian identified place where those students can study from this really unique worldview. And, and that's a worldview that's rejected by most, if not all, public universities in Canada. And I think that's really important because one of the things that I want us to think about is, you know, why these schools why religious identified schools are important. Uh, and also, I would say that what is particularly problematic is not having an evangelical law school, but really the ways in which we view the law versus how we view religion. So some of what I want to focus on today, again, is how we see the law versus how we see religion, because the ways in which we talk about religion in this country, and particularly here on the West Coast, uh, is very, it's very curious, right? So for those of you who don't know, we are living in the most uh, irreligious province in Canada. Vancouver, Victoria are, are the most irreligious cities in Canada, meaning they have the the least amount of people that identify with a particular religion. Uh, at the same time, we have a high number of people that identify as spiritual. And so this spiritual but not religious is quite a phenomenon that we talk about in the kind of religious studies circle. Uh, in fact, if you talk about SBNRs, spiritual but not religious, that's actually quite a common acronym. I want to reflect I want us to reflect a little bit on what is happening socially, religiously, politically within Canada, and how some of those things uh, are influencing places like TWU, as well as how they're uh, impacting legal decisions, and particularly here in the Trinity Western case. And then, and then one of the things that I've been thinking about lately has been the court of public opinion and what the court of public opinion really knows or think they know about Trinity and its covenant and whether this response, this collective response that much of Canada had was a response that involved critical reflection. And I would argue that it's not, that it's been a very um, kind of follow the leader response to how we should, uh, re how should we should respond to Trinity, how we should feel about Trinity, the ways in which we critique Trinity. And then also, I, uh, because, uh, you know, because Trinity was so open with me and really wanted me to get an idea of who they were, I want the audience here to get a sense of who, who are these people that, that choose to attend Trinity and, and what is the place and importance of religious schools or religious groups in Canada? That's a lot in a 45 minute slot, which is quickly ticking by, but I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> so I want us to think about this kind of religion versus the law. And so the law, as it says here, the law, we often view the law as this kind of highly moral, neutral governing body, whereas we often view religion as a social construct, particularly those of us who maybe identify as a humanist or atheist or uh, an academic, we will talk about religion as this as this social construct, what we might have called man-made at one time. But I would argue, and, and others have done this, so Ben Berger, for example, at um, Osgood Law, if you're interested in this concept of law as a social construct, he has written about this and spoken about this. So, so the law is also a social construct that's that is largely rooted in Christian Judeo traditions and norms. You know, the reason that we have anti sex work laws isn't because of this, you know, feminist uh, concern for protecting women's bodies. It's really about kind of a so called Christian moral stance. And so if 
we accept this view of the law as not a neutral body standing above everything else, uh, we then have to realize that we have these two social constructs that are both vying for recognition. So law on the one side and religion on the other, although I would say that they're not really on opposite sides in many ways. So just a sort of very quick overview of Trinity Western. So they're a private evangelical university in Langley. Uh, they, I won't give you all the history, but they were founded in 1962. At that time, they were a junior college. Their founding denomination was the Evangelical Free Church of Canada and America. They have six core values, um, including obeying the authority of the scripture, while also pursuing faith-based and faith-affirming learning. Uh, and um, and for, for many people of faith, the authority of the scripture, whatever that means, whether it's the Bible, whether it's the Torah, for many people, the authority of that scripture comes before the authority of, of this, this socially constructed law. And I would say also that, you know, every university that you go to has uh, the, their core values. Uh, and what I would say is Trinity is much more transparent about what their core values are, because until, until the not so distant past, students, as many of you know, they had to sign this covenant and, and agree to the things that were written in it. And so students are generally, and Fathlane staff, quite aware of what the core values are of Trinity. For me at UVic, I, I know we have core values. I, I know we have policies and stances on something or rather, um, but we're not told about it. We don't have to sign on to it. There's an assumption, I guess, that we're not going to cheat, that we're not going to sexually harass, but there's not a lot of transparency. I'd have to really go digging for what UVic's core values are. So for those of you who either know or do or don't know, Trinity has in the past been the focus of these two major human rights cases. And at the center of both controversies uh, is their community covenant. That's not exactly true in the first case, but I will elaborate. And it's allegedly discriminatory rhetoric. So back in the 1990s, Trinity had applied to the BC College of Teachers to take a sole responsibility for a teacher training program. Up until that point, students could do their first four years of teacher training at TWU, and then for their fifth year, they had to go to SFU. And so that application was denied by the BC College of Teachers because at that time, Trinity Western had this code of conduct, which was the precursor to the, to the community covenant. And it was called Community Standards, Responsibility for Membership in the Community of, of Trinity Western University. And they had a prohibition on homosexual behavior. And in 2001, the Supreme Court actually decided in favor of Trinity Western. So um, what the college, the College of Teachers was arguing was that the policy was discriminatory and thus it was not in the public's best interest to approve the application. Uh, they attempted to argue that TWU's teacher training program would produce teachers that were themselves discriminatory. To my knowledge, every single student that has graduated from that program and has gone on to teach None of them have ever had discriminatory um, uh, charges against them or accusations. In fact, some of their teachers, I think, have won awards for their teaching. Some of them teach in, in um, public schools, some of them teach in religious schools, and they've become known as quite a good teacher training program. I would also say that, you know, if if we believe that discriminatory teachers are only coming out of Trinity Western, um, we're not thinking much beyond the end of our noses. And this, I would say the same for the law school, right? So you're going to have, uh, you're going to have so-called homophobic law students that are going to graduate from UVic law, which is quite a progressive law school. And you're going to have very liberal lawyers that would graduate from TWU law have had that law school been um, allowed to exist. 
And so in that document, the one that was in place in 1999, what it said uh, was homosexual behavior was part of a list of biblically condemned activities. It wasn't the only one. It also included premarital sex and adultery. So pretty standard conservative Christian expectations. So what is in place now is the community covenant, our pledge to one another. So that's what it's called. And in the covenant, they have a section. I'm just noticing that some people are in the waiting room. So I'm just kind of clicking to allow them in. So uh, one of the sections of the community covenant is this thing on healthy sexuality. And the, the single line within that that got them into hot water was that according to the Bible, sexual intimacy is reserved for marriage between one man and one woman. That is the whole eye of the storm. I, you know, what I... I mean, of course, I don't. I mean, of course, I don't agree with that, right? I'm an only gay woman. I'm not Christian. Um, but I also, when I read this section on healthy sexuality, I think that if you sort of removed references to the Bible or to God, that actually reads it's fairly progressive, right? So you could read it as young people face significant challenges in practicing sexual health within a highly sexualized culture. It could say like a feminist view of sexuality or, or a woman's view of sexuality or a disabled person's view of sexuality. Uh, I think that what it says in this section, much of it is really valuable to a much broader audience. And so why everybody kind of lost their minds and really people did kind of lose their minds for this very small sentence without stepping back and looking at the entire forest um, was, was really fascinating to me and kind of continues to be fascinating to me. So, oops, uh, sorry, just hit the wrong button there. Okay, and so there's some other areas within the community covenant that I find significant. So in the, in the precursor to the covenant, it specifically mentions abortion as a biblically condemned activity, not surprising again, evangelical school. Um, the covenant doesn't use this word. So instead, what the covenant says is you have to treat all persons with respect and dignity and upholding their God-given worth from conception to death. So of course, that wording would include, uh, would preclude abortion. Interestingly, there was virtually no attention in the media regarding TWU's possible infringement on a woman's right to choose. I believe only one of the interveners made mention of it. That was uh, West Coast Leaf. Uh, and, and so I find that quite curious. Again, this sort of really staring very closely at a single tree without stepping back. It also makes me wonder, um, you know, whether we still care less about women's rights than we do about other rights. And this last bullet here, the use of materials that are degrading, dehumanizing, exploitive, hateful, or gratuitously violent, including but unlimited to pornography, uh, this statement is really quite feminist in nature. So, of course, not all feminists nor feminist organizations are anti-pornography, but it has been a historically feminist position to look at the degrading nature of porn. Uh, you know, organizations, again, like West Coast Leaf, they've written reports on cyberbullying and its impact on young girls and women. Again, nobody stepped back to say, actually, there are some things in this covenant that, that make sense. It's not all fire and brimstone. It's not all based on a premise of hate, which was a lot of the rhetoric that was happening around Trinity. So, um, so again, for those of you who, who didn't follow this or maybe the last year of COVID or the last four years of Trump have erased your memory for everything else, um, it kind of went like this. So in June of 2012, they applied to the Ministry of Education for consent to open up a law school, essentially. They also applied to the Federation of Law Societies of Canada, which is kind of the umbrella for all the provincial territorial law societies, I think with the exception of Quebec. 
um, both bodies approve. Very important, right? Both of these bodies, the Ministry of Education and the FLSC approve the application. And I believe there was quite a lot of back and forth between Trinity and the Ministry of Education. And it wasn't about the covenant, but more just about, um, you know, creating a, a criteria for a brand new law school. So then the following month, uh, deans of Canadian law schools, the Canadian Bar Association and others, they start stating their opposition to the law school. People really started getting their knickers in a knot. Spring of that same year, the law societies review the application. They look at the approval from the Federation of Law Societies of Canada and all provinces and territories with the exception of Nova Scotia and Ontario opt to approve Trinity. So the vast majority of Canada. Again, Quebec is, a, is an exception because they have a different uh, legal system. So then in October, the Law Society of BC, in, in what felt a little bit like bad politics to me, and I can speak more about that at the end if people want me to, um, they decided, because, because some of their members were starting to sort of poke at them about this, they decided to have a referendum and that however the, their members voted, they would follow. And so their members, and I, and I think it's important to note that very few of their members actually voted. So I think they've got 13,000, 14,000 members and a very small percentage voted. But of those that voted, the majority voted in opposition to Trinity Western. When that happened, kind of everything else fell apart. So the Ministry of Advanced Education revoked its consent. Uh, the Federation of Law Societies also revoked their consent. So then Trinity ends up in court. So I'm, I'm just gonna fly through this really quickly. So in Nova Scotia, so the Nova Scotia Barrister Society, the Law Society of BC, the Law Society of Upper Canada, <clears throat> they all go to court. Um, Trinity wins at Nova Scotia and in BC, and they lose in uh, Ontario. So the Law Society of Upper Canada is now called Law Society of Ontario. That's the only place in which Trinity Western loses their case. It goes to the Court of Appeals or the equivalent of the Court of Appeals, the same results. So they win in Nova Scotia, they win in BC, they lose in Ontario. At that point, Nova Scotia um, decides not to appeal to the Supreme Court, but both other organizations do. And so it then goes to the Supreme Court. Uh, and ultimately in June of 2018, the Supreme Court rules in favor of the law societies. And they, the, so the Supreme Court of Canada, they, they kind of talked about proportional balancing as its reason for siding with the law societies. And so this proportional balancing, uh, balancing happens when there's sort of two protected groups that are pitted against one another. And so what are those two rights in question? So so according to the BC Human Rights Code, I'm just going to talk about BC because that's where we are. So you can't discriminate based on the following characteristics. And I won't go through all of them. You can read them yourself. But on this list is religion as well as sexual orientation. So those were the two rights in question. And the Supreme Court needed to do a sort of a balancing act, to decide which way the scale was going to tip. And so here I've written this list in alphabetical order, but it's not a top down, bottom up list. It really, in other words, like no one right on this list is more important than the other. They run side by side, but this isn't really how we generally operate. Uh, you know, given where we are in 2021 versus, say, where we were in 1990, uh, who's at the sort of top of that list or getting a lot of attention right now really shifts and changes. So I think we can all agree right now that race is getting a lot of attention, as it should, right? That BLM movement has been very strong, very successful, as it should be. Um, but it's getting more attention than, say, discrimination based on poverty. Um, now, there's nothing that says 
poverty, but it's more source of income. So if your source of income happens to be social assistance, you're much more likely to, um, to experience discrimination in the housing market if you're looking to rent. Uh, than you would if perhaps you were married or not married, which is also a protected group. And so, uh, and so that kind of creates a problem because how do we now decide who's on top? And there, and should somebody be on the top? Again, I would argue that all of these groups should be protected equally. That the scales shouldn't tip one way or the other. But in fact, but in fact, they do. And we're very quick to make the scales tip one way or the other. So and of course, sexual orientation is getting a lot more attention than religion. Listen, I'm I'm an openly gay woman. I'm very grateful for the rights that I have. I'm very grateful that I'm a, I'm a kind of on the top of the pile right now. But one of the reasons that I that I became interested in this was because the the thought that my rights were potentially, potentially oppressing the rights of another group made me feel really quite uncomfortable. And, you know, interestingly, when, when I would tell people about my, my master's thesis and that I was looking at Trinity Western, the response from people that I didn't know the very first question they would ask was, oh, did you go to Trinity Western? And there was always a tiny bit of suspicion in their voice. Who is this person that I'm talking to who's talking about Trinity Western? Surely only a person that went to Trinity or identifies as an evangelical Christian would be interested in, in, such, a, in such a topic. And so, um, and so when I said, no, I didn't go there, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a fit, uh, then the assumption was the complete opposite, as it was from the people that did know me, the, the response was, oh, well, obviously, we know what side you're on, meaning I was absolutely, because I fit into this mold of being a feminist or being left wing, that I must automatically be in opposition to Trinity Western. And it, it wasn't about that for me. It wasn't about Trinity is right or wrong, or they, or they should or shouldn't have a law school, although I certainly had opinions on those things. And in fact, I will say right now, I was in favor. Uh, I, was, I was in, in support of them getting a law school for many reasons. Um, again, you know, that, that place to look at the world through a very particular lens, um, or this, this assumption that, you know, that it's going to produce discriminatory lawyers, I, for me is, is bunk. So the other thing that I would say about this list and this kind of who's on the top and who's on the bottom. If I if I sat in the class in a classroom with my colleagues and I made a derogatory joke about gay people, uh, my colleagues would call me out as as they should. Um, but the same might not be said if I made a religious joke. In fact, I would go even further than that to add the caveat that it would depend on which religious group I was talking about. So if I sat in class and I made an anti-Semitic joke or an Islamophobic joke, my colleagues would, again, take me to task as they should. But if I made a joke about evangelical Christians, I can almost guarantee that I would get a laugh, at least from half of my colleagues or a knowing look, or an absolutely, or hear, hear, whatever it was. I, I think that the, the chances that I would offend somebody, particularly within the university, uh, is very low. The university has become a place that is quite hostile, I think, to religious identity, particularly conservative religious identity. So, one of the things that I wanted us to kind of consider today, so this idea of this kind of court of public opinion and how much we knew and didn't know about Trinity before we all 
jumped on the kind of let's hate Trinity bandwagon. So one of the things that I that I was doing while I was doing my research, uh, of course, I was paying very close attention to the media. Uh, and probably for a good year, there was stuff on a very, there was stuff in major newspapers on a very regular basis. And most of the media had a very narrow focus on Trinity. So that is, Trinity was drawn as homophobic uh, and, and were in direct violation of the rights of LGBTQ people. So whether this is true or not, and you could argue both ways, um, it's a very small part of the picture. And so I think because the media had such a narrow focus, the court of public opinion didn't have a lot of other information to go on. Um, the, the question of the state. <laughs> so for anyone who has defended a thesis or a dissertation, there's that, there's that moment, that beautiful moment where you know the panel is about to say, they have no more questions. And so I was at that moment uh, where they were about to say, we don't have any more questions. And one of my committee members actually said, I have one more question. What was the role of the state in all of this? Uh, and it was the only question that actually stumped me for a minute. I had to really think about that because it really wasn't what my master's was about. Um, and, and I would say that the state also had a very narrow view of what was happening and the potential implications of siding with one group or another. So not only, and the state could be the Supreme Court, it could be the Ministry of Education, it could be the law societies. Some people did argue that the law societies, uh, they, were, they were really more, they're more about um, you know, looking at the behavior of lawyers and not necessarily chiming in on who should or shouldn't get a law school. Uh, although there's lots of arguments that that are the opposite of that. Uh, but there were so many state bodies. So, you know, you open up this, this private school that is going to allow your students to study from their unique worldview and you suddenly have many bodies in your backyard it's a lot of interference and again whether that interference is justified or not is can we could debate all day but um but, but what they were doing was trying to provide a space for students that maybe wouldn't have a space otherwise. So that sort of brings us to, this, to the students, because I, I do want to give people an idea, or my perception at least, of, of who Trinity is made up of. And so in the course of my research, I interviewed... Um, I did about 30 interviews, although some of those were, you know, I interviewed a, a single person twice, once before the Supreme Court decision and once after. So there are about 25 people. And that was faculty, student, and staff. And for the students, interestingly, the vast majority were in favor of greater inclusion for LGBT students. Um, some, in fact, were even opposed to the covenant. They wanted to see the covenant either gone or made voluntary or at least removing the line that defined marriage. For those that, that favored the covenant, uh, and I assumed that that was going to be all of them, and so I was quite surprised to find out that that wasn't the case. For those that did favor the covenant, most of them wanted to speak to me for a very specific reason, because they feel that their way of life is slowly being eroded. That is how they see it. And, and there is something to it. So when they, when they decided to go to Trinity, what they expect is that they were going to attend Trinity and be surrounded by like-minded students. Instead, many of those students actually talked to me about feeling shut down and feeling like there was less and less space uh, at Trinity uh, allowed for uh, very conservative um, viewpoints. Certainly when you read Trinity Western University student newspaper, so it was um, something that I did, so I read all of their student newspapers going back to 1962 to the 
so, so just before I started the writing process, you can really see a, a very interesting progression in that paper. And you can see the paper really reflecting what's going on in the kind of larger public arena. And so when you read the paper now, which has articles like my queerness is not up for debate, um, it it, what it tells me, again, is that many of those students are swimming in the same waters as us, and that like any other school, there are some liberal students and some very conservative students. Uh, one of the things that a student actually said about the student newspaper was that the student newspaper had become a pit of liberal trash where conservatism goes to die. I thought that was very poetic. Um, and I actually found myself having a, a sense of compassion for those who feel like Trinity is getting swallowed up in this secular world. Now, I don't think that that has fully happened, but certainly it's not the school that it was in 1962. And I, I found myself feeling uh, compassion for them, even if I didn't agree with everything they were saying. There were certainly a couple of students that I spoke to that I, I don't know how I could care. I, I don't know how I could categorize them in, using words other than homophobic. Um, but even for those students, I felt some compassion. They chose to go to a school where they could be with like minded people. And that's how we all kind of choose our community. We want to be with people that reflect our worldviews. You know, I might go to a gay bar to feel safe with my wife. One might choose to go to historically Black or women's college for the same kind of reason. So regardless of whether the student I spoke to was conservative or liberal, what they did all express was gratitude that Trinity Western gave them the one thing that they could not find in a public school, the ability to be openly Christian, and to look at things through a Christian worldview. And that is something that the public universities certainly do not embrace. Uh, and so if I am approaching my studies from a feminist worldview, from a queer worldview, from a person of color, if I was a person of color, from a disabled person's uh, worldview, all of those things are really being embraced now. But if I'm doing my studies through a Christian worldview, that is going to be suspect to the, to the majority of my colleagues. Uh, in fact, when I, um, I have a fellowship at the Center for Studies in Religion and Society, and when I had filled up my application and kind of my, my thesis statement, somebody had cautioned me to just somewhere in there find a way of saying that I'm not religious because the assumption was going to be that the panel was going to read it and see me as this conservative Christian person and perhaps deny my application, deny my application for the Center for Studies and Religion and Society, because perhaps I was a conservative Christian. That is a funny place in which we find ourselves. So, so lastly, the, the court of public opinion. So, I spoke to so many different people from so many different professions and different stages in their academic career. And I, I, I really, other than some people who were also in kind of in the maybe religious studies field, similar to me, I couldn't actually find a single person that knew anything about Trinity other than they're homophobic. They don't have gay students. If you're gay, you can't go to that law school. Um, and that is, those things are, are, you know, they're not even a small piece of the picture. They're just, in fact, just not true. Um, and so, again, as I said earlier, you know, people made an assumption about my own ideology simply because I was interested in Trinity or because they knew that I was kind of a lefty. And so then they also made assumptions about my ideology. So I'm aware of the time and I only have one last slide and I apologize if I've been talking very quickly, but I wanted to make sure that I left space at the end for questions. So I had this slide at the beginning. So uh, our Trinity Western University's actions or were their actions, quote unquote, against the law? Because that is the response that, that I got from many people. They're breaking the law, what they're doing is against the law. 
And so what I would say is really the problem isn't, as I see it, the problem isn't really Trinity's actions. What is problematic is how we view the law versus how we view religion. So again, religion is viewed as this cultural construct, this kind of you know, man-made object, to use an outdated term, whereas the whereas the law is viewed as neutral and sitting above these cultural constructs. And that we now have, if we admit that they're both created, you know, by, by humans, then, then what we see is that we have one now pitted against the other. So, you know, why did the Supreme Court rule in favor of Trinity in 2001? Were they simply reflecting the cultural values of the time? I would say that that they were. Uh, did the same thing happen this time? Did they make a decision not based exclusively on the law, but just where we find ourselves in, let's say, 2018 when they made the decision, where they couldn't possibly have a ruling that that's that even slightly looked or felt or sounded like homophobia. I, I, you know, I, I was hopeful, or at least I was, well, hopeful is not the right word. Um, I would have liked to have seen Trinity win. Uh, and I would say that, um, you know, I'm not alone in that. So the BC Civil Liberties Association, they defended Trinity back in, 2001 uh, as an intervener and they wanted to do the same thing this time uh, but their members voted in opposition and the woman who was the executive director at the time um, actually had said that she felt like they had it right the first time in defending and defending trinity she's also an openly gay woman i felt like the supreme court also sort of bow to this court of public opinion um, for, for so many ways that I, I, we just don't have time to get into right now. Really, you know, if discrimination based on religion and sexual orientation are both prohibited, then how, uh, how I viewed it is that whichever decision the Supreme Court made would be both right and wrong. Ultimately, though, one set of rights was judged as superior or more important to the other, regardless of what the charter says, regardless of what the BC Human Rights Code says. Really, you know, in the in the bigger picture, my goal is to slow down the conversation, to have people think more reflectively. I'm teaching a first year course right now, social justice studies, and I have said to students, Listen, if you come to me and you say Trump is really racist, I'm going to agree with you. There's no doubt in my mind, but you need to be able to back that up. You need to be able to go back and give me examples. You can't just say it because everybody else is saying it. And I think that's what really happened here. And so again, I want to slow down the conversation. I want people to reflect critically. I want people to do inward and outward kind of critical reflections. And my hope is that eventually, you know, the scales aren't going to be tipped over to one side or the other, but can instead achieve this balance that I think the law intended. So I'm going to stop there. About 30 seconds shy of 45 minutes. Thank you so much, Paige. Uh, that was <laughs> Really, yeah. I mean, you were right on the button with the time there too. That was great. Big deal for me because brevity, as I said, is not my strong suit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so, uh, it's a very interesting discussion, especially because the BCHA was involved in quite a few things that you were talking about as well. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing so that I can um, see you guys. I would. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know what your policy is. I would love if people's cameras were on so I could actually see all your faces. Um, yeah, but... I think everyone has the ability to turn their cameras on if they oh, uh, you, here. Hello, you. are comfortable with that. Um, and then do we have any questions? I know Jake has his hand up, uh, so I'll ask him to unmute. Jake, do you want to ask your question? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Paige. I, I don't like the recording on here. That's why I'm disguising. I love it. 
Uh, that was a very well presented and thoughtful presentation. I would take issue with a couple of things. One is uh, the problem with social construct and putting things on one side or the other. It's sort of giving a religion an equal footing with science. Um, and a, a relig a religious religion is an uncredible worldview. Science works on, uh, on well, law, the law works on science and religion works on magic. So, uh, hey, Jake, just, just sorry, sorry to interrupt. Just make sure you have a question um, as well, just so just we're respectful to, of everyone's just time. About, just about to ask that. Do you feel, uh, did you, do you notice yourself being a bit of an apologist for TWU? Do I find myself as being an apologist? No. Um, I mean, I, I don't mean to laugh, but I think a lot of people uh, would would laugh if they if somebody uh, called me an apologist. Uh, no, I have I have no need to be an apologist. Um, you know, uh, so your question is not funny. It's legitimate. It's just that it's so it's so not characteristic of me. Um, you know, I, I think that when we say things like the law is based on science. And religion is based on magic. Um, that's a that's a sort of a slippery slope, and I I try to avoid those sort of for me. I try to avoid those judgment statements. Um, I think that well, first of all, the law is based really on a Christian worldview here in Canada. And so I don't think it's necessarily based on science. There's all kinds of things in, in the history of law that are also racist and designed in a way to keep out outsiders, keep out non-Christians, keep out non-whites, keep out women. So the law has a, has a you know, historically problematic um, history. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the challenge when you say that, that, the challenge you can get into is that you're sort of creating a straw man when you say religion is based on magic because you're going to get many, many, many people that are going to have eloquent arguments that religion is more than just magic. They're going to have all kinds of proofs for why God is real or God is real to them or how they have seen God work in the world in a way that you, you actually just, you can't argue against that. There is no legitimate argument because you're never going to convince that person. And so, um, and so I, I sometimes caution people by saying, you know, um, religion is magic or the law is science. Um, I think we're going to go with Teal next, and then I think Aaron was after him. Uh, I'll just unmute Teal. Go ahead. There we go. Hi. Hey, thanks for the great presentation. I know we have to do our talk. You and I have to do our coffee thing at some point. Anyway. Yes, we do. Um, but no, um, so I guess the thing I thought was really interesting was there were two things. One observation, then a question was the sort of the conversation around why people went to Trinity. Um, when I was a school teacher, I brought up concerns with the school about inviting them to the university fair. And I was told they have a great soccer team. But I like that idea of like people creating their own community. And I think that does challenge my perception of universities and post-secondary education being one where you're supposed to be exposed to other worldviews rather than like, shielded from your own but I think that it's an interesting aspect I went to university in Calgary as a hard lefty so that was always um <laughs> I never quite got that but the question I have for you was so I was you know looking over the BC Human Rights Code and one of the things that's like I was talking about in a report that's coming out for the BCHA next week um shameless plug look for your inboxes friends um was the content around discrimination and like the bona fide like the bona fide and reasonable justification for discrimination mm -hmm. and I guess the, the interesting aspects like I was wondering if you could explore that a little bit more because I know in some cases, like the, the case of like the one that we were looking at was the um, the Knights of Columbus Hall that denied uh, two women the ability to rent the hall mm. when they found out they were lesbians. And, mm. you know, the, the court ruled that that was okay because they had a right to discriminate against these people because they had a like, bona fide reasonable justification through their religion. And I guess the main question I'm trying to ask is, it seems like people can discriminate, but as soon as you try to give them money or invite them into communities like legal certifications and things like that, that's where there's more tension. 
right? Mm -hmm. Like they can have a cloistered university as much as they want, but as soon as they take public funds, then it's problematic. So I was wondering if you could sort of speak to that sort of rambling open-ended question <laughs> a bit more, because I'd really be interested in your opinion on the, especially on like- Yeah, it's, it's really tricky. You're right. There are lots of situations in which you are legally allowed to discriminate. So in employment, for example, if you have a bona fide occupational requirement, you can, so, you know, I'm not going to hire you as a taxi driver because you're blind. Am I discriminating against your disability? Yes. Is it a bona fide occupational requirement that you'd be able to see in order to drive a car? Yes. Um, Trinity doesn't, uh, Trinity doesn't take public money, but they are operating in the public in many ways, right? They're, te they're, they're training teachers. They wanted to train lawyers. Uh, and so they are straddling that, that world, right? I mean, they are, they were very different school in, in 1962, where right? there were 17 students that first started. They were out in the Fraser Valley, which really separated their students from the city, right? There wasn't, there wasn't, easy access to Vancouver. Uh, it was a junior college. You could only do two years there. They are a liberal arts school now. And, and they're um, one of their, their, their captions that they started, I think in the seventies. Uh, and there, there is somebody on the call that could maybe correct me is it was um, training Christians for the market play for the for the marketplaces in life right so there was this recognition um, because historically evangelical christians really saw uh higher education as the place where you would go and you would lose your faith uh, and so um and so but they did slowly recognize that not every student was going to become a missionary or or become a an evangelist that it, that was not the calling for everybody. And so how do we get our students ready for the public marketplace without them losing their faith? Uh, and so, so it, it's, it's a tricky question because they are straddling, you know, they, they've created a community, but it's not an insular community. There is a recognition, I think, on behalf of Trinity that, that, as I said, you know, they are swimming in the same waters as the rest of us. I'm not quite sure if I'm answering your question. It's a really, it's a really tricky question because they, you know, it, it's one foot in, one foot out. This isn't a, this isn't a Bible college, right? Where they're training students just to enter into that exclusively Christian world. Um, and then um, you had said something about, um, you know, university is the place where we're supposed to be exposed to a lot of different people. Was it you that said that? Yeah, I mean, I do think that that happens in, in Trinity as well, right? So they do have some Muslim students. Uh, again, they have, they do have like openly identified L LGB students. I don't think they have any trans students. They have a um, they have a one TWU, which is kind of their gay straight alliance. They have students that were missionary kids. They have students that went to the public school. They have students that didn't grow up uh, Christian at all, but have chosen this school either because they came to religion later on or whatever it is. And so I think that they are getting exposure. But again, we can make the same argument if I had chosen to go to a woman's college. I lived in a woman's residence, actually, as an undergrad because I wanted to be with other women. All right, I think Aaron is next now. Aaron, you're unmuted. Uh, hi, Paige. Thank you for hi. your uh, presentation and perspective. I had um, four kind of short questions, and I'd, I'd <laughs> love, love to get your response to that. All right, hang on. Let me. Um, write them so, down. I don't remember them all. Okay, go. Uh, they're short, so maybe okay. even one at a time. Whatever works for sure, you. Sure. Sure. Um, the first question was about um, how, you know, to what extent we can really say that students choose to go to Trinity Western University and the context around that choice and how sometimes we have to, as young people, negotiate with our uh, financial support and our parents and, and they yep. can have an influence on um, that, that choice. And I know that at least in some cases, there are students who are really pushed toward Trinity Western by Absolutely. their 
uh, families and it might not necessarily be their free choice. Um, I guess that was more of a comment, but I promise the rest are questions. No, Maya, can, I can respond to that, though, absolutely. Um, and Aaron, maybe you ask sure. two now and then go to the back line because we do have some people waiting and then ask you two after they've had the chance to speak. Okay. So sure. do you want me to answer that or do you want to ask your second question? Oh, uh, I, I'm more interested in your response to my other questions, actually. I think okay, we all ahead. pretty much can agree with with what I just said. Yeah, um, I, I, I wanted to I'll ask. Push, about, I'm going to push it out a tiny bit. Uh, but whether... I... Oh, I wanted to ask um, whether we can really say that this is a community where uh, the students are expressing their own unique worldview if they're required to uh, sign a community covenant agreement enforced by the administration and imposed on them. It would seem to me that it's not their worldview if they're. Um, if it's being imposed on them and they're they're required to sign on to it? That's an excellent question. Okay, so to your first one, um, every student that I spoke to chose to go to Trinity. Um, it wasn't easy for some of them because Trinity is very expensive as a, as a um, private school, very expensive. One of the most expensive schools in Canada. Um, but like any other school, right, so maybe I went to UBC because both my, both my parents are profs at UBC, which is not the case, but could be. Um, and for some students, um, they didn't really know anything else, right? They grew up as mission kids uh, and they had only ever experienced a Christian education. And so that's where they ended up. Is that choice? I don't know. Uh, choice is a, is a funny you know, it's a, it's a choice is a thing that it either pinches or slips away too quickly. Uh, so can we say that they're expressing a particular worldview if they're forced to sign the covenant? So one thing that I would say that I, that I should have mentioned earlier uh, in August of 2018, so very shortly after they lost at the Supreme Court, they removed the mandatory signature requirement of the covenant. So while faculty and staff still have to sign it, students do not. Um, I, I did hear that if students are in kind of student leadership positions, uh, that maybe they still had to sign it, but I haven't actually been able to confirm that. Generally, those students that are in student leadership positions are like Christian students that really, you know, are in favor of, of the things that, that the covenant says. I, I would say, and I have said this to, to people at Trinity, including some of their upper level kind of administrative staff, this is a, this is a body of primarily 18 to 22 year olds. And so if you think they're signing it and abiding by everything in it, including not having sex, you're delusional, right? Like that, it just, it, it just doesn't happen. If I decide that I'm not gonna have sex before marriage, a piece of paper isn't gonna make any difference. Um, and so I, I would say that students still find a way to express themselves. And again, the student newspaper is, is huge evidence of that. But it's a, it's a really good, it's a good question. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I just want to note real quick. Uh, I know people who worked at the student newspaper and it is uh, heavily controlled by the um, administration at Trinity Western University as it is not an independent newspaper. Um, everything. Yeah, I, I don't think that that's the case anymore. Actually, it's a really when you read that paper, it is incredibly liberal. Mm -hmm. um, incredibly liberal. Anyway, next we have Jake, I think, again. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paige, I just want to apologize for calling you an apologist. <laughs> <laughs> no need to apologize. No, no need to apologize. <laughs> what I meant to say is I, I saw some leanings towards trying to accept some of, of what a uh, paragraph of theirs might have said. For, for instance, if, a, if, a, if an under otherwise wonderful tasting meal is laced with arsenic it will still kill you and so i looked in there at that and, and realized that that's a problem uh law has evolved so it has fallen a scientific principle it's it starts with the 
ideas and comes to a conclusion, whereas religion starts with a conclusion and adjusts the facts. So my, my point to you, a question to you is, uh, are, are you, do, do you find yourself tilting in some ways towards much of what they are promoting? Oh, what do you mean by much of what they're promoting? Because I see them as promoting a lot of things. So can you, um, you know, I, I haven't started to believe in God. I haven't decided that I'm going to leave my wife and go to, you know, some kind of uh, conversion therapy. I, um, my, my politics are, are no less left than they were. You know what, I think, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question because I turned 50 last year. And if I was giving this talk 25 years ago, it would look very, very different than it does now. Uh, I think that, um, and, I'm, and I'm not trying to be ageist, I'm really just talking about my own perspective, that I was much more interested in the tree rather than the forest. Um, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm just society of worldviews, right? I'm not, I'm not interested in a, in the kind of 1980s melting pot vision of Canada, where we all start to look like one another. I, um, there are some things that are, that are harder for me to swallow. So I, I take much more issue, frankly, with the line that, that I feel infringes on my right to choose um, than I do about the other stuff. Uh, and I, I, I really try to embrace other people's opinions, but that's a really hard one for me if I'm having a conversation with somebody that I perceive to be anti-choice. Um, but I, I don't find myself sliding but again maybe you can give me an opinion of what what it is that you see them promoting uh, well and i'm sorry for using the word magic but i couldn't think of the word metaphysics at the time and uh also people who are 25 shouldn't go around complaining that, uh, uh, insisting that they are 50 people, what? Who are 20, people who are 25 shouldn't go around claiming to be 50 are you not 25 no, I'm 50. I can't believe that's really, really. Yes, I turned 50 last year, 1970. Right. Well, all right. Amazing. I have friends that think I'm a vampire because I, it's, <laughs> it's really, it's just, listen, it's like, it's good genetics and flattering lighting. That's all it is. Okay. I think we're going to move on to Teal's question now. Uh, Teal, let me just find you in her thing. All right. Uh, there you go. There we go. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. No, I also want to ask a follow-up as well. Cause like one of the things that I'm, I'm fascinated by is like with the human rights code, the, the interesting aspects that arrive when like what constitutes a reasonable justification discriminates. So like the example you gave was like a really good one of like, you know, someone who's blind probably can't be a cab driver just yet. Um, totally makes sense. And I guess the question I had was like, how does that come up against situations where it's like, you can be a Catholic and gay, mm -hmm. right? Like you just are, are apparently not supposed to like, practice gay sex but you can still be gay and a catholic right or you can still be an you know, evangelical and you can be recovering from homosexuality in heavy air quotes friends um but you know you can be getting over your same sex attraction again in very heavy air quotes and so i guess like the tension i have there is like have or maybe you could point me to, in a direction of some other cases that explore this idea of like what constitutes a, a just a bona fide justification because i was kind of surprised at what i found with the the case relating to the the two women in um in coquitlam with the with the, the the knights hall and i was just wondering if there's any other cases out there that kind of push up against that like is it really necessary for you to discriminate to be a good christian um or to be a good whatever insert religion here is it necessary uh... or, or maybe not necessary is the right word but like what would count as a good justification right because i could see like some justifications make obvious sense some of them are tenuous and i guess i'm interested in that fuzzy middle ground yeah, I mean, it's it's all fuzzy middle ground, right? That's what makes this so difficult. And for me, so intriguing is that there, it's not black and white, right? it's a million shades of gray. You, 
um, I'm going to just jump back a little bit because you had, you had used this phrase just yet. So if you're blind, you probably can't be a cab driver just yet, Mm -hmm. right? Because we don't know where cars are going to go and we don't know. And so religion also does change, right? And we can see that with, we can see that with Pope Francis, right? Versus previous popes where he said like the Catholic church owes an apology to the LGBTQ people. That's mind blowing that the Pope, the leader of the Catholic church would say such a thing. And so religion also does evolve. What is a legitimate justification for me? It's going to be very different from what it would be for you or what it would be if somebody was a, was a fundamentalist Christian. I would also say, um, and I, and I, you know, I talked to a lot of my interviewees about this because they did not want to be understood as fundamentalists, which they saw as very different from evangelical. Uh, And even those liberal students, many of whom identified as evangelical Christians, because it meant something to them uh, that was very different from what I would imagine or what we think of when we think about evangelical Christians in the United States, for example. Um, the, the justification thing is, is, you know, for me, like, if you're, if you're outside of a, you know, a woman's health clinic and trying to terrorize women that are going in for an abortion, like, to me, I just feel like there's just no justification for that. But that person believes so deeply in their soul that there is an absolute, very clear justification for that. And they're going to have proof, again, heavy air quotes, right? They're going to have proof. And so justification, you know, we justify all kinds of shit that we do, right? The good and the bad. And so there's so many of these terms um, just they just slip away so easily because when you're talking about faith, you're going to get just as passionate of an argument that faith is real and God is real and God has worked in my life in this, in these ways. And there's my justification as you're going to get from the other side of it. It's, it's one of these topics where we have to kind of put logic aside a little bit and maybe I'm stabbing myself in the foot for saying that, um, but faith isn't about logic. Can I, can I just quickly follow up on that? Because I think the, the thing I was like, I, I think the courts are starting to reflect a lot of like reasonable justifications being heavily subjective, right? Because, you mm-hmm. know, I was just reading Laurie Beeman's new book on like, mm-hmm. you know, what is culture and religion is culture and, and this idea that, you know, you, you can ask a rabbi what constitutes real Judaism and then you ask someone who's, who's practicing Jew and they're totally different things and those are both very real. So I guess the challenge that I run into with some of the activism that we're doing with the BCHA is that if that reasonable justification for discrimination is completely subjective, Um, and it seems like it's going in that direction in a lot of court cases, then it makes it very hard to have some kind of core codification. It's often very subjective. Yeah. And I guess I just more of a a reflection on the the challenge between like subjectivity and objectivity when it comes Mm -hmm. to these things. And I don't think there's a resolution to it, but yeah, thank you for your your take on it. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, I think we're back to Aaron now. Go ahead. Great. Okay, I'll uh, I'll continue with my uh, my questions. Um, we talked at the beginning about some of the competing values that we have, and we talked about um, religion and law. I think there's also another value here, which is um, access to legal education. Mm-hmm. So in our society, um, legal education is a prestigious and competitive um, endeavor. You need to write an LSAT. You need to get good grades. Um, I'm, I'm actually a law student, so I had to go through that process. And it, it feels maybe a little bit unfair if there's um, a special school just for uh, Christians or people who are willing to subject themselves to the community covenant agreement. Maybe they don't need to compete against UVic or UBC, and they can go to Trinity Western and, um, and uh, remain in that uh, insulated community. So I was curious if you have any thoughts about the value and the prestige associated with legal education and not restricting that to um, on on certain ideological grounds. Mm. Um, 
Well, I think law school is restricted to people that have certain ideological grounds, right? I think the law in general, right, is based on this very certain kind of ideology. Um, and law school is inaccessible to the vast majority of people, um, either for financial reasons uh, or because you're not a great test taker, right? Like the LSAT is not a good measure of what kind of lawyer you're going to be. I'm sure you know that as a law student. Uh, you know, there was there was an argument that um, that Trinity would be taking seats away from prospective law students uh, that that couldn't abide by this covenant, which I found a funny kind of argument because it it still was increasing the amount of seats overall. So those fifteen students that might have gone to UBC. Osgood, U of T, wherever it was, would now go to Trinity if they felt like that was a better fit for them. And maybe not just because it was Christian, but because they were going to have a focus on charity law, which is something that we that we that we need, right? Um, so those other seats would still be opened up. Uh, so I'm I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here, but I think if uh if there was a law school that suddenly opened up that were for students of color or that were for Jewish students, I just don't think we would have the same kind of response. We could make the exact same arguments, right, for and against, but I just don't think we would for whatever reason. Like, who's going to who's gonna actually stand up and and over a law school that was for students of color. No, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna do it unless you want to really be labeled as racist or be, or you don't care about being labeled as racist. And so again, I I think a school that embraces a particular worldview. Listen, that law school also had to have a curriculum that was going to train lawyers to be ready to practice law, right? So the Ministry of Advanced Education said, yes, they've done that. The Federation of Law Societies of Canada said, yes, they've done that. And so the law school wasn't just about um, only Christians can attend here. Lot, lots of not, I mean, I have friends that went to the school of nursing because it's one of the best schools of nursing in Canada. And like, again, whatever, I'll sign the covenant and I'll go. So I, I'm not sure that we could assume that it was going to uh, weed out all other students. And, and listen, like it's, it's problematic, right? I'm not, I, I'm not saying that it's not, it is for sure. It's one of the things that's so interesting to me is that these are things that are rubbing up against one another. And I do recognize that it's, that it's problematic. Part of what made me so interested is the ways in which we were talking about this that didn't have a lot of critical reflection behind it. Great, thanks. Um, I just have my last question now. Um, I remember you mentioned that you expressed the opinion that the Supreme Court of Canada bowed to public opinion. Um, and I thought that was quite an incredible thing to say. I say it with a grain of salt. I say it with a grain of salt. Sorry, what? Okay, well, maybe I'll invite you to elaborate um, because I was wondering if you are questioning the independence of the Supreme Court of Canada or if you think that they have a, a lack of integrity um, or a lack of respect for the principle of judicial independence. Mm, no, I don't think they have a lack of integrity. That would be, that would be a jump. I don't think that at all. Um, so, so I'll give an example. So with the interveners, right? So they had more interveners than any other case before the Supreme Court. It was almost 30 interveners, right? It's, it's just unheard of. And initially, when organizations applied for intervener status, uh, the, the judge that was sort of vetting the applications said no to the majority of them and yes to sort of a handful. Because really, you know, if, if, you've, if you watch that case, if you go back and watch that case, the interveners on either side 
right? So all the interveners for TW, they were all saying the same thing over and over and over. And the interveners for the law sides were saying the same thing over and over and over. So you really could have had sort of three on each side and you would have gotten the same argument. What ended up happening when he denied the majority of the applications is that the public outcry was phenomenal. There was accusations of kind of queer silencing because so many of the applications that were denied were from LGBTQ support groups uh, that um, that that the judge that the, there was homophobia in place. The outcry was incredible. And then, of course, what did Chief Justice McLaughlin do? She went back and she reversed that, which again almost never happens. And she allowed every application at intervener status. For what reason? The only, the, really, the only reason I could see is that the public outcry was so fierce. It was so quick. It was so swift that, again, in order to appear fair and balanced and not homophobic, they just said yes to every intervener. It, I mean, and again, the interveners, I don't think, I don't think 30 made any more difference than 12 would have or four or one on either side. Uh, so I don't think that they lack integrity, but I think that they're also aware of, of public opinion and where we're at. I mean, they speak about that in their decision, right? Like this is, it, it's, a, it's a different world and they wanna recognize historic oppression. They weren't taking into consideration just the law, but they're also considering sort of where we're at as a, as a country. And I think we're, we're all, like, to say that we're completely neutral, whether we are a law student or a chief justice, mm, not sure that true neutrality exists for any of us, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's aspirational. Um, I think we have one more question if Aaron's done. Aaron, okay. Good questions. Um, yeah, so our last question uh, is from Tegan. I assume it was in the chat, so I'm assuming it's a question. Um, isn't the point of democracy to do things according to public opinion? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, but we had a variety of opinions, right? So we had opinions on both sides of of the argument. And so, which opinion do we go with? And again, both religion and all of these other things. Uh, run side by side. And so ultimately, which opinion do we go by? I, I mean, for me, I just wonder, is there not a way for these two things to exist simultaneously? So for example, a Trinity Western University School of Law that is, that is going to prepare students to be lawyers or legal advocates of some kind, and safety for LGBTQ people. Can those two things not exist? I think they can, I mean, they do, right? Trinity Western doesn't have a school of law, but certainly there are, um, you know, there's the, there's the um, uh, what is the, the Christian Lawyer Association uh, that Barry Bussey as kind of the head of, I can't remember what they're called, the CCCC. Oh no, he's the head of the Christian, Canadian Christian Charities Coalition, but there is a Christian, Christian Legal Society, CLS. So, you know, they are Christian identified lawyers. They are practicing law through a lens of faith. These two things do exist. And so why it couldn't have also existed with, um, with Trinity, I'm not sure. Like, isn't that also democracy? to have both of these things, to make space for both. Yes, Barry Bussey. Yes, thank you. 
I think that's all the questions we have time for tonight, but thank you so much, Paige, for joining us. Um, I thought that was a very interesting uh, topic to raise and very timely as well with all the debate going on with the churches and COVID and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is um, another topic that I'm really fascinated about. Speaking I of might the church actually, I might do a coffee talk, Teal, about about that yeah i just want to yeah. plug teal's uh talk next week one more or not next week two weeks from now um just want to plug it one more time so not uh two thursdays from now but instead the wednesday of that week so wednesday the third of march at 5 p.m right teal uh i think that's what we talked about um teal and adriana i believe as well both of our research team uh leads are going to be giving a talk on the report that's dropping on monday which is all about uh tax exemptions teal do you want to do a little bit of a plug for that because you know the topic far better than i do yeah i'd be happy to um so yeah we have a, a big report coming out on whether or not exploring the question of whether or not places of worship that discriminate uh, against groups of protected groups or that operate as private clubs or that violate COVID health regulations should continue to receive generous permissive tax exemptions. Mm. And we have a, a big uh, table we've created of all the money that's flowing to places of worship. And we explore the different arguments in detail. And um, it's very live right now. We quite literally had to update the report yesterday because <laughs> there was a ruling on an injunction in one of the courts. And uh, Emily and I were going back and forth about which quote to include in the report. So it's literally hot off the press and it's, it's got a pulse on what's going on in the province right now. And uh, it's going to be exciting. It's one of our more dynamite reports. Yeah. So the, question of, the question of tax exemption came up for Trinity as well. Oh, that's why I was I was asking sort of the, the questions adjacent to it. Oh, yeah. There's um, you, people can be have their own racist club if they want to, but if they want tax exemptions, suddenly things get more complicated. <laughs> mm -hmm. So those questions and more can be debated uh, two weeks from now on a Wednesday. Um, so yeah, the event page for that event will go live on Monday as well as the report. Uh, so everybody stay tuned. And again, thank you so much to Paige for joining us. Um, and yeah, thank you. Such, such good questions. Like really thought provoking questions. I really appreciate it. Um, Jake, Jake is my favorite person now uh, because he accused me of being 25. So I shall um, forever be a fan. <laughs> everybody have a good rest of your night uh, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks, everyone.